the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched 143 small satellites for a wide range of customers on January 24 in the company's first dedicated Transporter 1 rideshare mission. The two-stage Falcon 9 rocket lifted off Sunday morning from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The mission included 133 commercial and government spacecraft along with 10 Starlink satellites. Two and a half minutes after liftoff, the first stage, which marked the fifth launch after being previously used for NASA and commercial launches, got separated from the rocket. Seven minutes later, the booster landed on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. This marked the 73rd recovery of a first stage booster for SpaceX. 59 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's second stage started deploying satellites into sun-synchronous orbits. The process took more than half an hour to complete. The deployment sequences were carefully timed, with 48 tiny satellites for the Earth-observing company, Planet Labs, being the first to separate from the rocket. The last satellites to leave the rocket's upper stage were SpaceX's 10 Starlink satellites, intended to provide better coverage to those in the polar regions. This cost-cutting smallsat rideshare mission broke the record for the most satellites lofted into space on a single launch. The Indian Space Research Organization held the previous record by deploying 104 satellites in a single launch in February 2017. NASA and Boeing have set a target date for the second launch of the Starliner spacecraft, which was designed along with SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft, to return crewed launch capabilities to American soil. On Monday, company officials announced that Boeing is planning to launch the second test flight of the Starliner capsule on March 25. A United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket will launch the uncrewed spacecraft from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The unpiloted demonstration mission, named Orbital Flight Test 2, is a repeat of Boeing's first test flight in December 2019. Software problems on the OFT-1 mission prevented the Starliner spacecraft from docking with the space station, forcing a premature landing under parachutes at New Mexico. The announcement of OFT-2's target launch date came just one week after Boeing's Starliner passed a critical software requalification test. During the test, Boeing teams conducted a full software review and several series of tests to verify that the Starliner's software meets design specifications. If all goes according to plan, roughly 31 minutes after liftoff, the Starliner spacecraft will conduct an orbit insertion maneuver, taking the spacecraft on its way to the ISS, where it is scheduled to arrive the next day. The Starliner will then autonomously dock itself at the space station's Harmony module and will stay attached to the station for about a week. After the spacecraft is docked with the station, the seven-person crew of Expedition 64 will unload any cargo on board and inspect the spacecraft. Once its orbital stay at the ISS is over, Starliner will autonomously undock from the station and will return to Earth for a parachute-assisted landing. If Boeing and NASA do not find any other significant Starliner issues during the flight, the first Starliner to fly with astronauts on board could follow as early as June of this year. On Tuesday, the University of Arizona-led mission team announced plans to delay the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft's departure from asteroid Bennu for two months. The OSIRIS-REx mission, launched in September 2016 atop an Atlas V launch vehicle, is NASA's first asteroid sampling mission. After two years of journey through the vacuum of space, the spacecraft rendezvoused with asteroid Bennu on 3 December 2018. It spent the next several months analyzing the surface to find a suitable site to extract a sample. On 20 October 2020, the spacecraft approached Bennu and successfully collected the sample. It scooped up a substantial amount of material from Bennu's surface, likely exceeding the mission's requirement of 60 grams. The spacecraft departure window opens in March 2021, and the original plan had OSIRIS-REx setting course for Earth on March 3rd to bring home the asteroid samples it collected. But now a revised timeline has the spacecraft leaving Bennu on May 10. This won't affect the target delivery date of September of 2023, but it will allow for more observations of the asteroid. Also, leaving Bennu's vicinity in May will consume the least amount of the spacecraft's onboard fuel during its departure maneuver. The mission officials now plan to send the unmanned probe on a final pass by the asteroid to gather some high-resolution pictures before heading home with its precious payload of rock samples. The planned flyby would bring the craft back to within about two miles of Bennu. 
The newly proposed flyby will give researchers a look at the scars left on Bennu's surface during the touchdown in October. The maneuver will also give the team a chance to test the spacecraft's cameras and other scientific equipment to see if it was clogged with dust during the sample collection maneuver. If the instruments are sufficiently clean, OSIRIS-REx could be sent on a bonus mission to a second asteroid, Apophis, after its scheduled rendezvous with Earth in 2023. Axiom Space, which was founded in 2016, is an American privately funded aerospace company aiming to provide commercial missions to the International Space Station. They also plans to own and operate the world's first commercial space station. On January 26, Axiom Space revealed its clients for its first privately funded and operated mission to the ISS. Their first mission, dubbed the Axiom Mission 1, is being arranged under a commercial agreement with NASA. Slated to launch on a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, the crew for the mission includes Larry Connor, an American real estate and technology entrepreneur, Aiton Stibb, a businessman and former Israeli fighter pilot, Mark Pathy, a Canadian investor and philanthropist, and Michael Lopez Alegria, a retired NASA astronaut who logged almost 260 days on four prior missions. Lopez Alegria, who is now a vice president at Axiom, will command the 10-day Axiom 1 mission. Connor, who has flown more than 16 different aircraft and competed in the U.S. National Aerobatic Championship, will serve as the Dragon's pilot. At 71 years old, Connor will become the second oldest person to fly into space, only surpassed by the late John Glenn, who made his second space flight at the age of 77. The Axiom 1 mission is the first in a series of flights to the space station, including one possibly crewed by actor Tom Cruise and director Doug Liman. Axiom did not disclose the price the three commercial astronauts paid to be on the mission. Industry sources estimate the per-person price at around $55 million. Depending on other activities scheduled at the space station, the Axiom 1 mission could launch as soon as January 2022. NASA conducted the first hot-fire test of new RS-25 engine test series that will help the agency's space launch system rocket on future deep space missions. The test of the RS-25 developmental engine, numbered 0528, marked the beginning of a seven-test series designed to provide valuable data to Aerojet Rocketdyne as the company begins production of new RS-25 engines. During the test conducted on Wednesday, the RS-25 developmental engine was fired for about eight and a half minutes, the same amount of time the engines must fire to help send SLS to orbit. The engine was fired at 111% of its design power, which is the same power level needed to help launch SLS on its missions. Burning liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, the four RS-25 engines firing simultaneously will generate a combined 7.4 meganewtons of thrust at sea level and 9.1 meganewtons of thrust at vacuum. The new test series will evaluate the performance of engine components made with cutting-edge manufacturing techniques. The testing is part of NASA's and Aerojet Rocketdyne's efforts to use advanced manufacturing methods to significantly reduce the cost and time needed to build new engines. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. The test flight of SpaceX's Starship serial number 9 is on hold as the company awaits approval from the Federal Aviation Administration. Previously, SpaceX had planned to perform a suborbital flight of its SN9 on January 28. The vehicle would have made a flight similar to that by the SN8 vehicle, this time going to an altitude of 10 kilometers before landing back on the landing pad. However, temporary flight restrictions closing airspace around the test site were unexpectedly lifted around the middle of the day, even as SpaceX was preparing the vehicle for the flight. According to various sources, FAA requested additional information about the vehicle and flight plan before giving final approval. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk criticized the FAA for the delay. He wrote on Twitter, unlike its aircraft division, which is fine, the FAA space division has a fundamentally broken regulatory structure. Their rules are meant for a handful of expendable launches per year from a few government facilities. Under those rules, humanity will never get to Mars. A second launch attempt on January 29 did not get nearly as far. An FAA air traffic advisory early in the day stated that the launch had been cancelled, although the TFR remained in place. 
According to an FAA spokesman, the high-altitude test flight of Starship SN8, which launched successfully but exploded during the landing attempt in December, violated the terms of its Federal Aviation Administration test license. It is unclear what part of the test flight violated the FAA license. On Friday, the FAA confirmed that they will continue working with SpaceX to resolve outstanding safety issues before approving the next test flight. Later the day, SpaceX announced that it was now targeting no earlier than February 1 for the SN9 launch. After the launch of SN9 was reported to be postponed, SpaceX rolled out its next Starship prototype, serial number 10, from High Bay, making its way to the launch site for the first ever double Starship staging. After arriving at the launch site, a giant crane lifted the vehicle and gently lowered it over the Starship launch pad A. SN10 will undergo ambient and cryogenic pressure tests, perform a series of static fires and a wet dress rehearsal before its high-altitude test flight. With the rollout of SN10, SpaceX has put on full display their high level of confidence in flight readiness, given that SN10 is right next to SN9. Meanwhile, taking advantage of delays to Starship SN9's planned high-altitude launch debut, SpaceX conducted the first pressure test of Starship test tank SN7.2 on January 26. On Tuesday, SpaceX loaded the tank with liquid nitrogen and spent around three hours performing the test. Later, Elon Musk confirmed on Twitter that the test tank had passed the initial pressure test. Musk has previously said that Starship should hold a pressure of 6 bar for orbital flights and 8.5 bar to achieve an industry standard safety margin for crewed flights. With the initial pressure test complete, the next test could involve pressurizing SN7.2 until it bursts. This will determine the amount of pressure this 3mm stainless steel test tank can hold before it fails. Watch our previous video to know more about the 7.2 test tank in detail. Link in the description. According to a recent Bloomberg report, SpaceX is planning to drill for natural gas near the Starship launch site in Texas. Production plans are on hold due to a legal dispute between the SpaceX subsidiary, Lone Star Mineral Development, and Dallas Petroleum Group, which claims ownership of some inactive wells sitting near the Starship factory. SpaceX didn't reveal exactly what it planned to use the natural gas for, but it stands to reason that SpaceX might be interested in using it as fuel for its Raptor engines. Tim George, an attorney representing Lone Star, said at the hearing that SpaceX plans to use the methane it extracts from the ground in connection with their rocket facility operations. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. The nose cone of Starship serial number 11 got stacked atop the barrel section last week. The entire assembly will be lifted and mated with the thrust section of SN11, which is currently inside the midbay. Last week, SpaceX scrapped the thrust section of serial number 12, and it appears that they have cancelled the production of prototype serial numbers 12 to 14 and moved on to serial number 15. The engine skirt of SN15 got mated with the aft dome section last week. The engine skirt covers the otherwise exposed Raptor engines of the Starship vehicle. The common dome of serial number 17, which serves as the roof of the oxygen tank and bottom of the methane tank, got sleeved last week. The construction of super heavy booster prototypes is in progress at the shipyard. The top propellant tank section of booster BN1 got fully assembled inside the high bay last week. The taller propellant tank at the top hints that, unlike Starship, the super heavy booster will have its oxygen tank placed atop the methane tank. This could reduce the length of the downcomer, which carries propellant from the upper tank to the engines through the lower tank. A reduction in the length of the downcomer will decrease the total mass of super heavy boosters, and for SpaceX, every gram of mass reduction translates directly into an extra gram of payload. The thrust dome of booster BN1 was also spotted at the construction site last week. All the sea level Raptor engines of super heavy will get attached below this section. Watch our previous videos in the playlist to get updates about the remaining Starship prototypes. Link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.